Well, I want to tell you a story about a guy. His name is Jim. Um, Jim had a really a fantastic love of people. Just uh, was one of these guys that just really wanted to pour his life out into other people. And he had a, this burden also to communicate the gospel. And he wrestled with this problem of how he could reach um, people. He, he saw this group of people that he really felt God was putting a burden on his heart for him. And, and yet they were so different from him. And uh, he, they really didn't have a biblical understanding. So there are these huge barriers of just how am I going to communicate to them? How I'm going to get engaged with these, these people. So even with these obstacles, he felt I've got to try with my life. And God had given him a vision of the difference that he can make in their lives. So he went to great lengths to relate to their culture and following the example of Paul, which is our scripture for today, um, becoming all things to all men, people, so that you might save some. And that's just what he did. So uh, he took some great risk. Uh, for starters, he shaved his head. And he said, I, I want to look like them. So he shaved his head completely, except for one little patch back in the back, which he grew out into a long ponytail. That was different, right? Pretty, pretty brave. So. Um, and he had hair to begin with. That's what was strange, too. So then he uh, dyed it a different color. So he get this guy that used to have a full head of hair. Now he's bald with a pig or the ponytail coming out of the back, dyed a different color. And he started dressing like them and wearing their fashions. And um, he gave up his business attire and started to dress like them. He, he changed his eating patterns. He started to eat the things that they were eating. He even uh, learned their language, kind of the vocabulary and, and you know how they talked. And he went even further. He left his home in the comfort of his nice neighborhood and he moved into their neighborhood and he started hanging with them every day and you know playing with their children and talking with these people just so he could you know convey these biblical truths to them and he, as, as he did this, you know, uh, he went to a lower lifestyle. Um, spite of their non-Christian lifestyle, he entered into that. And in almost every case, as he did this, he was rejected. They just didn't receive it. You know, here's this weird guy with us. What the, the church did was kind of strange. You'd think that the church leaders would... Uh, you know, commend a guy that had this kind of dedication and this kind of sacrifice. They didn't. They rejected him. As a matter of fact, they openly criticized what uh, he was doing. Nobody would pray for him. Uh, pretty much by himself here. Uh, the very people that uh, should have supported him uh, didn't. They turned his backs on him. And here he was alone with these people that were very different than what he was. And he had made all these sacrifices. This, this guy, Jim, or as he's commonly known as James Hudson Taylor, all right, that's him in the middle, is the man who almost a century ago opened up China. And today there are millions of Christians in China, and most of them have as their spiritual father, Jim, James Hudson Taylor, who left the comforts of everyday life in order to reach these people. Paul did the same thing to the Corinthians. Um, he teaches us about what it means to have this really strong compulsion to, to take the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, here's he was what I would call flexibly rigid. Uh, he was flexid, if we could make that word, because he never compromised the gospel and yet he's willing to be flexible so that he might be able to communicate and reach people that would never have even heard of him or his life unless he had adapted. Now as we go through 1 Corinthians, we come to the ninth chapter, and the first 15 verses we're not going to do, and um, in those first 15 verses, just to kind of give you a little uh, capsule here, Paul teaches them about receiving pay, and he said that when he was among them, he didn't receive pay, and they're challenging him and saying he's not really an apostle because really an apostle, or in the Greek system, a philosopher in their day would have had uh, patrons that would have paid their way, 
And Paul wouldn't do that. Instead, he made tents. That was his trade. And the reason that he didn't do that is that we didn't want anybody influencing him with their money. So he goes through the first 15 verses, and he covers that, and he says, it's okay to be paid. I just want you all to know that. It is okay for the pastor to be paid. You don't have to make tents, okay? And if you want to influence me with your money, you can just go right ahead and try, right? <laughs> we'll see what happens. But anyway, that's what, that's what he spends those first 15 uh, verses. He said, I could have done that, but I chose not to. And now he, he turns to his method or his way of reaching people. And we're in 1 Corinthians 9, beginning with the 16th verse. And I've, I've used a different translation this morning. And, uh, you, you know, we use a lot of different translations here. Uh, there, there is no one uh, uh, only anointed translation in the Bible. There are some that you like better. But usually we use the new common uh, translation that we have there. But uh, I just didn't like the way it translated one word. So uh, I'm using the NLT today. He says, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled, and that was the word I liked, I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. But if I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am a free man with no master, I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. The last part here, this verse 22, uh, would sound more familiar to you, probably from the NIV, which I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. That's, we've probably heard that before. Well, remember that Corinth is a lot like Lexington, a uh, very diverse city. It's actually more diverse than Lexington, but uh, we're seeing Lexington really become more than just a little bluegrass city. You know, we have a lot of ethnic and also religious diversity. But in Corinth at the time, there was the Greek culture, and the Greek culture valued philosophers and the mind. And then there were Romans that were there. A lot of Roman soldiers had been kind of going on their retirement to Corinth. And the Roman culture was very rigid, and uh, Roman soldiers were very rigid. Uh, we know that in Corinth there were a lot of what was called free men. And free men were slaves that had been either uh, released or had been purchased out of their slavery. And these free men and women were the blue-collar workers, more or less. They had no inheritance. They had very little rights. But they were solid-working people, very pragmatic. Uh, the city was, uh, had a lot of free men and women in it. And then there were Jews. And uh, at the time of Christ, there's approximately 60 million Jews in the Roman Empire. Excuse me, I said that wrong. At the time of Christ, there's 60 million people in the Roman Empire, nine million of them were Jews. I still think that's a lot, pretty large percentage of Jewish people, but they had been kind of uh, dispersed across the Mediterranean. And of course, they had some rubs with the rest of the Gentile world because the rest of the Gentile world were polytheistic. They had a lot of gods. The Jews just had one god. So there's usually a lot of tension between the Jewish community and the Gentile community. But Paul had this passion, I mean, such a compulsion to reach the people for Christ that he gave up his own privileges. Verse 19 said, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. See, what he did was, was first sacrificial. He gave his own life. But then the way he did it was very imaginative. 
He says, I was compelled. Verse 16, another translation, uh, the NASB that I read uh, most days says, I was under compulsion. God was pushing him. Uh, he felt he really had no choice. He had to do this, had to preach the gospel. And I want us to understand that first because this compulsion is behind everything that Paul does. Over and over, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. That's what drives his life. That's the number one thing. And he feels that, that, that God is pushing him. God is not giving him a choice. His life has been, uh, you know, turned upside down by Jesus Christ. And it, it wasn't about the church. It's not about whether he's successful or not. It wasn't his reputation. It wasn't his welfare or his safety. Everything is about the gospel. And he's so determined. He, he's so compelled. Nothing stands in the way of the gospel. Paul's a man of wealth and prominence. His family uh, was very wealthy. Uh, he went to the best rabbi school. He was be an Ardea, a Harvard grad. He, he was uh, well read, and yet he gave all that up. When, when, when Jesus reveals himself to him on the road to Damascus, it's the gospel for Paul. He has to take the gospel to the world. Has this just strong and wavering motivation. But he's also flexible. And you see, th these two things, they don't always go together. You find somebody that's very driven, but sometimes they're not very flexible. When he was around a Jew, he said, he ate like the Jews. Um, he talked like them. He reasoned like them. He quoted scripture to them. He, he, he would remove any barrier, and even though he knew he didn't have to keep these old dietary laws. Till he, still, he said, I, became a, I was a Jew when I was around the Jews. When he's around the Gentiles and non-Jews, well, you know, he had lobster and, you know, oysters on the half shell and stuff like that. And, and ribs and all that junk, you know. And that was okay. He says, because I follow the law of Christ. I don't follow this old law, this old dietary law. But whoever he was with, when he was with that person, he adapted. He was flexible. He didn't say, well, you guys, you know, you need to dress like me and talk like me and look like me and act like me and adapt my lifestyle because I'm a Christian, so you have to do the, these things. Um, I mean, it's just really brilliant what he did. Marketing genius, if you want to go on that side of this. You know, he, he looks at his demographic and he goes, well, what must I do in order to get my message to these people? Because it was all the message that he was after. There's some real strength in being flexible. I mean, these two things together, first sacrificing your own desires and then being flexible, you know. The, the church, we, we do some strange things with evangelism. And uh, I, I mean, we really do. There's the the evangelical kind of mugging guy that uh, you know you go into a phone book and you emerge or phone booth and you come out uh, there's no phone booths anymore that's really a bad illustration you go into the closet and you come out of the closet and you've got this big s on your on yourself and you're you know just going to go out and just you know kick the world for jesus and usually somebody else's neighborhood or or you know the the evangelical ambush where we we lure honest, unsuspecting people into some kind of event, then we get them there and we lock the door and we sing, you know, 40 verses of just as I am until somebody finally gives in. You know, they didn't know that it was going to be uh, preaching here. We, we, th we told them it was going to be wrestling, but once we got them here, right, then, then we give them the message. Or, or the bombing mission where, you know, you just blanket an area with tracks. Um, a couple Easter's ago, a church... Uh, not here in Lexington, but in another city, actually dropped thousands and thousands of tracks on Easter out of a helicopter. And it's like, you know, we, we blanketed the whole city. Well, they got fined for it, you know, which I thought was a good thing. I, I like the track, but it's like, how effective is this? But that's, you know, we do some strange things in the, in the church when it comes to uh, evangelism. Or sometimes it's kind of the, you know, the, the hurting the fish. I know I'm mixing two metaphors here, but you kind of get everybody in the building and then you let the big fisherman up at the, up at the pulpit throw some bait out, you know, and try to catch a few this Sunday. It's just some strange things. For Paul and every other person that's been effective, it's being flexible. Uh, how, how would we think if someone did that to us? 
you know, treat it as like an object or a trophy to say, well, you know, I gave him the gospel and he believed. I, he doesn't know anything about me. I don't know anything about him, but he first believed through me, so I got one on my Bible there. You know, it's not done like that. It's always through relationships is how people usually come to Christ. Got a picture here that I took out of Lowrider Mag. If you guys would start taking Lowrider, you could see stuff like this. The, the police department in Oakland uh, did this. Uh, they took a normal police car and they made it a Lowrider. Uh, still has a standard logo on the lights and the siren, but includes, you know, you see some, some chrome wheels, some lifts, and a 500 watt sound system. Just so they could pull into some neighborhoods and relate to some young people that were in gangs in Oakland. I've suggested this to Josh, and he's, he's working on it. He's going to have one of these. Paul applies the same principle to evangelism in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, I become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. That's the way that Jesus did it too. You know, we, we often look at the, the words of Jesus, but, but we don't always look at the method. And if you look at the method of how Jesus went about uh, things with people, we can learn a lot about how we can do things today. And, of course, uh, his method was one of always you know, going to where the people were. We have the one instance um, in, in Matthew 2 of Matthew, uh, the tax collector. He was also called Levi. And Jesus walks by his tax collecting booth. And a tax collector in those days was kind of like a gang boss, you know, like crime boss, because they used extortion. And they were also traitors. They had sold out to Rome. And so Jesus walks by and he calls Matthew. And that night he goes to his house to eat dinner. And this is in uh, Mark 2, 15 to 17. It says, Later Levi, that's Matthew, invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. I love this in the NLT. It says, There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. A little comment there. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to, to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. That's the way of Jesus. He hangs with the sinners. That's the way Paul did it. Okay. He goes to anybody, and, and he tries to, you know, break down all those barriers. It's the way Hudson Taylor did it. Jesus was more concerned with sinners than he was with his reputation. And we will only carry the gospel, his good news to others, when we have more concern for them than what we do for ourselves. When, when you have a mission, when you have a compulsion, you're going to look at anything that's standing in that way, anything that needs to be torn down, and you're going to be flexible. Being flexible is strong enough and secure enough to be flexible. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever been up in the Sears Tower. I haven't gone up there. They say there's a glass observation uh, platform that you can step out on that only the brave will go out on. But the Sears Tower, you know, most, most skyscrapers are meant to flex. And, you know, it's either flex or snap is what the architects say, everything if you ever walk over just a long suspension bridge, man, that thing's moving around a lot. It can get pretty scary. But at the top of the Sears Tower, it's actually, I looked this up, it's made to move 36 inches and not break. So it can, it can sway over 36 inches one way and then back the other and not break. But on a normal day, it only goes about 9 inches. In a high wind, it'll move 15 inches. Now, this is the... The Burj Dubai, which is now the tallest, for a few years, the tallest building in the world, uh, over 200 stories, you know, twice what the Empire State Building is, half a mile tall. It's made to flex 60 inches, five feet. So if you're standing at the top of this Burj Dubai, you could easily be moving back and forth, five foot this way, and then five foot the other way, 
Yeah, I know. It gives you the willies, doesn't it? You know, people that actually work in tall buildings, skyscrapers, uh, a lot of them report being nauseated and having to move down, those that work on the top floors, because it moves so much. And yet, if it didn't flex, it would break. It would just snap. Have to make buildings that way because of winds and because of earthquakes. And, you know, guys, our, our world is going through some pretty high winds and some pretty intense seismic shifts right now in our culture. I mean, the, I really feel sorry for, for the youngest generation because it looks to them like truth has just become so, who cares? Who knows? You know? And things are shifting really fast, and people are, are looking for something to believe in. And each, each new generation has a kind of a different way to talk to them, you know. And it'd be kind of like if, if I knew somebody today that was, I thought, maybe seeking God, I might give them a Sandy Patty cassette and say, listen to this. Most of you don't even know who Sandy Patty is, see. Uh, that's, that's back. Oh, thank you, Trevor. Good. All right. Yeah, you've read your history books, you know. But it's like, here's the Gaithers. Go home and listen to this. This will really, you know, it just doesn't work. Every new generation has their new language and, and has a new way of, of uh, you know, looking at things. And, and you have to adapt. You have to be flexible. Following Christ has nothing to do of course, with our hair or our music or our dress or our piercings or our lifestyle, unless, like what we talked last week, in doing those things, we are trying to rebel against God. If we're trying to rebel against him, then those things do become important. But for most people, it's just insignificant. It's, it's just, you know, style. Flexibility is necessary as long as the wrong things don't flex. You know, under, under the, the skyscraper, there's 150 feet deep of concrete pilings underneath the skyscraper. They dig that foundation out, and they put in strong support so it can be rigid, it can be stable, while what's on top can move. And, you know... I thought about that. You know why people that are different from us scare us? And let's be honest. I mean, people that look different and act different than us scare us. I, I, I think that is in relation to how secure of a foundation that we have. And if we are secure in our own identity and who we are, then they don't scare us so much. But if we're not as secure, then it gets kind of weird and we start saying things about them that they need to change to look more like us. So this is where the rigid part comes in. Paul and Jesus, neither one of them compromised on the core. Remember earlier Paul said uh, back in chapter 5 that we went through, that was a rough Sunday, and he said, don't associate with people in the church who are sexually immoral. He went on to say, other people in the church, like thieves and greedy and drunkards and slanders or swinders, he says, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. Remember that Sunday? And we were all going, wow, that sounds pretty hard, all right? Not soft on sin, Paul isn't at all. And yet, you see, he becomes all things to all people so that he might give them the gospel. They just weren't flexible on the non-essential things. There's a slogan that used to be in the Christian church used back in the 1800s and into the 1900s, and you don't hear it much anymore. I think it's a pretty good slogan. It says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, or, or love is the other word that's often there. I think that's a good rule for us. You know, as we say, well, what do I need to adapt? What, what can I adapt and not give up my core? Well, you can give up the non-essentials, but you can't give up the essentials. So, so what are the essential things? I mean, everybody might have a different list on really what's essential to you. But I just think of a few things that I would throw out that I think we would agree on. That is, who is Jesus Christ? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Okay. What did he do? He gave his life as a sacrifice for your sins. Where is he now? He's alive. Those are essential things. You see, we can't compromise that. Or the building starts shaking, you know? It's, it's going to fall down. But there's so many non-essential things. And this is where 
you know, this, this is what's saddest because a lot of times we go to these non-essentials and we try to make them essentials. You know, do I vote Republican or Democrat? Yes. It's the answer, right? Do I vote Republican? Are we a Republican or a Democrat church? Yes is what we are. Okay. Should we sing hymns or praise songs? Again, the answer is yes. Not essential. Can I pierce my nose? Hey, it's your nose, right? Just don't try to pierce my nose, right? It's, it's not an essential thing. What if I want to new, read a new translation of the Bible that instead, where it says Jesus is Lord, that this new translation that they put out, that these kids have done, kind of, you know, says Jesus is the main dude. Is, is that okay to say Jesus is the main dude? Well, if it means that Jesus is Lord to them, then yeah, it's fine. Jesus is the main dude. It's not an essential thing. So many non-essentials. It's funny how we get hung up on them. And uh, the essential things sometimes we neglect. But Paul and Jesus and Hudson Taylor, hopefully us, we, we stand on those, those solid essentials. Well, let me close of this. Let, let me take this home to your kitchen table, all right? Let's, let's, let's see if we can move this discussion beyond this room to your table. Here, here's my first question for you. You know I love to give, give questions. Nobody ever answers them for me, but I love to give you questions, all right? And here's my first question. It's about compulsion or being compelled. Huge question. What is it that's compelling your life? What is the compulsion in your life? What is it that drives you? A lot of times if we're looking at core beliefs, they're attached to our primary fears. What is it that scares you the most? If, if you could go to that, you'll probably find out what your core is, what your real compulsion is. And then the second thing I'd like to take home around our kitchen tables, um, you know, it's, it's a most it's most important and it's a and a most the most difficult mission field is the field of people who are closest to us the most important mission field and the most difficult one let me say it again is the spouse the child the brother the sister the close friend the parent those that's the most difficult mission field that there is and these principles, I want, I want you to take this with you, these principles, you sacrifice, you're, being, you're willing to sacrifice yourself. And some of you have young children, and trust me, as they grow up, they're going to try to rebel. They're going to try to separate from you. That's a natural thing to do, is to try to separate from your parent. Okay? So what, what, what order ground are you going to fight for? What, what's going to be your, your battle there? You know, if they want to do something and look different, I mean, are you going to force conformity on them? Are you going to stake that out for them? Um, that, that's a difficult mission field. And so first you sacrifice yourself, all right? You say, I'm, I'm, I'm willing even for my reputation, to, for people to think some strange things about me, okay? But I'm willing to, to do this for this other person. The second thing is to be flexible, to realize you know, what things you need to hold on to and what things that you need to flex on. And the third thing is to know what really are those core things. Uh, what's, what's, what's bottom in my life? What's really important in my life? Huge questions. Let's, let's take a minute with it.
as deep cries out.